Welcome to Episode 7 of The Seed by Dan Thomas, published in 1967, adapted for Sci-Fi Radio Theatre production by Galen Porter. In our last episode, Alice met Winona in her home, a geodesic teepee she had built herself. Intimidated by the surroundings and the strong, tall, aloof, clairvoyant herself, Alice explained her purpose. She was seeking to reduce all pertinent bits of human experience to computer terms and asked Winona to describe her clairvoyant experiences. Winona repeatedly tried to convey that her ability did not lend itself to analysis by scientists. Winona explained that the extrasensory stuff began to blossom under hypnosis, but her psychiatrist had become nervous and ended the sessions when Winona started developing total recall of events that happened more than 600 years ago. Not to be deterred, Alice naively said, hypnosis isn't too difficult, would you trust me? Winona was hesitant to trust Alice, but offered to ask her psychiatrist to make the tapes of her trips available to Alice. Their meeting ended with Winona predicting that after Alice was initiated into the coven, they would see a great deal of each other. Alice knew her time was running out on her agreement with her husband, Eddie. She set up an appointment time for their meeting, hoping this consideration would frame her case in an amenable light. She tried to convince Eddie to agree to her living apart from the family until her project was complete. However, Eddie was adamant she return on the weekend or he would file for divorce on Monday. With the decision made, Alice turned her attention to her next step. Join us now for episode seven, as we see Alice tackling the problem of what to wear to take off at her first meeting with the coven. The coven met on Wednesday night. Alice's chief problem, aside from her natural nervousness, was what to wear to take off. She hadn't thought to ask. She knew that whatever she wore, taking it off would be a problem. She'd never dressed to undress before, and first impressions on the coven would be important. She didn't want to seem too formal, conveying the aura of a meddling professor, and besides, the transition from conservative dark suit to bare skin might be too abrupt. Nothing had been explained. She didn't know if there would be separate facilities for undressing or if unveiling was a part of the ceremony. She hadn't thought to ask. So she compromised by smuggling a small valise into her office at Mad Madeline's warehouse. Figuring that when the first members of the coven arrived, she could go down near enough to peek, then hurry back up through the barbed wire. That was more barbed wire than other barbed wire to change. But she neglected to take into consideration the unusual capabilities of the coven members. She had hardly descended the steps into the basement when a resonant feminine cry silenced the rest. I feel a presence. Alice was standing motionless behind a stack of bird baths that were more bird baths than other bird baths, hardly breathing. She was certain that no one had heard her sneak down because she wore shoes with rubber soles. It's the professor. She's over there. With no alternative, Alice stepped out from behind the bird baths that were more bird baths than other bird baths, walked down the narrow corridor in the artistic jungle, and stepped cautiously over the wagon wheel 
that was more of a wagon wheel than other wagon wheels. Winona and Mad Madeline stood in the middle with a middle-aged couple watching her approach. Alice was pleased to see that the man was wearing an open collared shirt and sport coat, which did not make Alice's corduroy jacket out of place. I was afraid you wouldn't show. I thought you always knew what will happen. Only when I want. I was afraid to think about it. You see, a coven properly is six couples and the earth mother. In the five or six times I've attended, I haven't had a partner. That doesn't speak much for male witchery. Don't worry. The single harness was all her idea. Mad Madeline wheeled Alice around with one arm and introduced her to the middle-aged couple. The man was tall, thin, and rather anemic looking. A bookkeeper, Alice later learned, the wife, heavy set and florid looking, was watching Alice closely. I get a confusing mess of signals from you. I can't figure you out. That seems to be a fault of mine. Fault? Mad Madeline laughed uproariously, her big frame shaking. I wish I had some extrasensory countermeasures. They can read me like a book. A light flashed behind her. Someone else is arriving. She moved to a small console and operated the electronic locks. The other four couples entered almost together, apparently arriving in two cars. Alice was introduced, but the names came so fast she did not remember a single one. All were older than she had expected. There was a certain sameness about the three men. Two of the women were somewhat plain and matronly. The other three had a definite witchiness about them. They would have been quite attractive, Alice thought, except for that look of peasant shabbiness. Well, we're all here. We might as well get on with it. She led the way through the maze of artistic treasures to a corridor Alice hadn't noticed before. At the end, they entered a large room, outfitted somewhat like an austere church. A small altar-like stand in the center held an open book, chalices, candles, various plates engraved with Kabbalistic symbols, wands, a sculpture of a large fleshy nude, and various knives and swords. Before the altar was a large stone, Around it, a white circle about nine feet in diameter was drawn on the floor. Alice felt Winona's hand on her arm. You're not supposed to enter the magic circle yet. I will stay with you and tell you what to do. The overhead lights were turned off and the candles lighted. All waited while Mad Madeline walked to the altar picked up a knife, and began tracing around the circle with its point while she recited some incantation Alice couldn't understand, and the candlelight flickered on the naked blade. She is charging the magic circle with the athame, the magic knife. The figure represented in the sculpture on the altar is the earth mother, enacted in our ceremony but Madeline. Completing the circle, Madeline faced the altar, raised the knife high, recited more incantations, carefully placed the knife on the altar, then started undressing. Take off your clothes. Somehow, Alice had not given much thought to taking off her clothes in such mixed company. Frantically, she took off her jacket blouse and bra. When she tried to step out of her slacks, she forgot about her shoes and snagged one pants leg. 
she bumped awkwardly into Winona and felt an appalling wealth of nakedness. Sorry. Your skis too. Alice looked around. The whole coven was waiting. She kicked out of her shoes, then raised each foot carefully and removed the sock. As casually as she could under the circumstances, she slid her undies down, stepped out of them with one foot, then kicked them to one side with the other. She sneaked a glance sidewise. Winona was giving her that mocking smile. She tried not to stare, but her peripheral vision told her that Winona's body was all she had expected. Mad Madeline had returned to the altar and was lighting the ornate incense burner. Winona leaned tantalizingly close to her. She is consecrating salt and water, the earth materials. If Winona's body was a fulfillment, Mad Madeline's carrot top mountain of flesh was a wonder. Each time the Earth Mother stabbed the air with the heavy incense burner, there was a mammarian earthquake. Alice watched the procedure, fascinated, but she had nothing with which to take notes. The first pair approached the magic circle. Madeline swung the incense burner near them repeatedly, still chanting unintelligible words. Cleansed, the pair stepped into the circle. The next pair stepped up to the line, and the long process was repeated. We will be last. Winona pulled Alice toward her so she could catch the words. Just before you step into the circle, I will blindfold you. Do you understand? Alice nodded, reluctant to end this moment of familiarity, aware that this moment was of greater moment than other moments, and not one to be repeated. Winona was looking at her speculatively and cocked her head. I think you better put some of your scientific objectivity into practice, Professor. Alice tried. She rapidly started multiplying random six-digit figures in her head, moving quickly to another calculation as soon as the first was completed and checked. Winona was watching her, puzzled. Now I can not read you at all. And your thoughts came through so clear a moment ago. How do you do that? Electronic countermeasures. Madeline nodded toward them. It was time. Winona blindfolded her, tying the knot tight. She also tied her wrists together behind her back. She took her arm and led her to the edge of the circle. She could hear Mad Madeline murmuring an incantation and she felt the heat of the incense burner as it swung to each side of her several times. Her cleansing ceremony was even longer than that for the others. Mad Madeline's stentorian voice then jolted her. Come forward, initiate witch Alice Penfold, and be received into the magic circle. Winona pushed. Alice took two steps forward, then stopped at the pain of the cold metal piercing her chest just below her left nipple. She felt something warm run down over her stomach. Did you, initiate witch, Alice Penfold, feel the wrath of the sword? You may signify by saying, I did or I did not. I did. Alice was wary of what the result might be if she said otherwise. She was conducted around the circle three times by Winona and Mad Madeline, who stopped at various points to recite more incantations. They pushed her to her knees on the hard stone before the altar, where Mad Madeline lectured her, 
warning her of the terrible penalties that would befall her if she divulged the secrets of the coven to the uninitiated. She didn't remember all the threats, but it was enough that her body would be widely distributed among various carnivores and scavengers. Unbind the initiate. When Ona unfastened the blindfold, Alice blinked, adjusting her eyes. Mad Madeline still had the sword pointed at her, matador style. The coven stood in a circle, watching her, their faces eerie in the flickering candlelight. Alice's hands were still tied behind her back. Mad Madeline lowered the sword. She stepped up to Alice, cupped her hand on the small rivulet of blood coursing its way across her belly, smeared it upward, and held the hand in front of Alice's face. This blood is symbolic of the wrath awaiting to descend upon you. If ever the secrecies of our rites are unveiled by you to those who are not entitled to them, do you, initiate which Alice Penfold, understand the significance of this symbolism? The blood seemed abundant, but with all eyes on her, Alice was reluctant to show concern. I do. Then know you that this is a warning. These secrets I am about to impart to you have been handed down since time immemorial. Before man had fire, he had the warmth of the Earth Mother. Into the Earth Mother was planted the seed of life. The Earth Mother antedates all sciences and all religions. In her, primitive man learned the rhythms of the Earth, the creative forces of nature. She existed and exists in all lands, spoke all tongues, and was worshipped by all people. In Greece, she was known as Gaia, Hera, Rhea, Aphrodite, and Demeter. In Rome, she was known as Maya, Ops, Tellus, and Ceres. In Phrygia and Lydia, she was known as Cybele. In Babylonia and Assyria, she was known as Ishtar. In Syria and Palestine, she was known as Astarte. She has been known and worshipped by many names in many lands, in many tongues, and in all seasons. Tonight, she will be known for all our purposes as Madeleine. Are you, initiate which Alice Penfold, prepared to accept me, Madeleine, as the living embodiment of the Earth Mother, to whom the secrets of the ancients have been bequeathed? Facing Madeleine's mammarian marvels, Alice had no doubts. I am. Unfetters the initiate. Winona untied Alice's wrists. Her hands were numb, but she felt rubbing them together would be too distracting. She was still the center of attention. The rock was cutting into her knees, and she couldn't keep from shifting her weight in an attempt to ease the burden on them. Madeline took a flat copper dish from the altar and held it out to Alice. Salt is symbolic of the solids of earth essential to life. Since time immemorial, man has revered salt. In ancient Greece and Rome, contracts were sealed with the eating of salt, the emblem of lasting friendship and honest business dealings because of its preservative powers. Initiate which Alice Penfold, I, the Earth Mother, direct you 
to partake of salt, a solid of the earth that feeds and nurtures man. Alice took the pinch of salt into her mouth. Madeline then handed her a small copper cup of water. Water is symbolic of the fluids of the earth essential to life. The first living creatures on earth appeared in water. For centuries beyond measure, there was no life on earth except in water. To ancient man, water also was a symbol of purity since it washed away sin. Water was a symbol of fertility since it nurtured life. Water was a symbol of humility since it seeks the lowest level. Water also symbolizes the life cycle since it falls to earth, rises and returns to earth again and again, as does the soul of man. In recognition of this symbolism, I, the Earth Mother, direct you, initiate which Alice Penfold, to partake of water, a fluid of the earth that feeds and nurtures man. Alice drank the water. It helped take away the salt. You knelt as an initiate, Alice Penfold. I, the Earth Mother, now direct that you rise as an apprentice witch of the coven to join our magic circle of ancient rites for further instruction into the mysteries of the earth. Mad Madeline raised her hands heavenward. Since time immemorial, the circle has been the symbol of the universe. The circle of the sky mirrors are mysteries. The cycles of the seasons rule the planting, cultivation, and harvest of our seed. Man is born, grows, flourishes, dies, and is born again in the cycle of life. In this unbreakable chain of the ages, the strength of the infinite is manifested. I, the Earth Mother, now direct that you, apprentice which Alice Penfold, become a part of our magic circle. Winona took her hand, as did the witch on her right. The human circle was completed, with Mad Madeline in the center. Winona squeezed Alice's hand. Alice squeezed back. Unified, we join our forces to commune with the ancients. Madeline raised her arms heavenward again and closed her eyes. Around Alice, the others of the coven also closed their eyes. So she did too, thinking that Madeline might peek to check up on her. At first, she felt nothing. But as she endured the long silence, she felt a warmth begin to creep over her body and a constricting heat somewhat akin to the blush of embarrassment. Alarmed, she opened her eyes. The others were still concentrating. Gradually, Alice's body warmth faded to a skin tingling glow reminiscent of a sauna and rub down. I, the Earth Mother, have communed with the ancients. They have given me permission to reveal to you, apprentice witch Alice Penfold, the mysteries of the Earth. I, the Earth Mother, therefore direct that once again you come forward and kneel at the Earth Stone. Alice's knees still ache from the first session. She knelt again on the stone. In the beginning, there was the way. The way was God, and God was the way. There was not but the Spirit of God in the void. The Spirit of God moved, contemplating on itself in its awareness. 
God desired to create, so she projected of herself the cosmos. Thus from God came the essence of life. God then put her creation in harmony with the law of attraction and repulsion, which is the form of action in God's universe. Alice's mind swam, trying to absorb the material. She wished she had some facilities to take notes. There were questions she wanted to ask, but Madeline did not give her an opportunity to interrupt. Thus, all souls were created in the beginning. Matter cannot be created or destroyed except by an act of God in reclaiming what she has given. God created souls for companionship. Thus, she gave them free will. Without free will, there would be no individuality, no companionship. Do you follow me, apprentice witch Alice Penfold? Alice nodded. She didn't know whether she was supposed to ask questions, but she sensed that if she did, Madeline's set speech would be interrupted beyond repair. Besides, she needed to talk all this out with Winona to determine how much credence to give it. Thus, creation of souls was long before man became their customary place of habitations. Some souls sought to become gods. This has given us prehistoric mythology. Some souls sought to identify with living things, flowers, trees, running waters. This has given us legends. Some souls sought expression of free will in various forms of animal, combining and mixing, giving us the traditions of unicorns, satyrs, centaurs, giants, werewolves, and dragons. But when man, one of God's many creations, developed beyond the ken of the apes and became the principal dwelling of the soul, God saw that this was good. Order was brought out of chaos. Man became the full expression of free will, the opportunity for each soul to perfect individuality. But the delights of man have corrupted the soul. The conscious has crowded the subconscious into an awareness. The origin of the soul has been forgotten. Religions have turned to the problems of man and away from the problems of the soul. Only a vague memory of the universal experience has kept knowledge of the soul alive. Jung's Collective Unconsciousness Mad Madeline hesitated, irritated at the interruption. Precisely. The goal of the soul, of course, should be godlike perfection, so it can return to a unity with God, preserving its individual identity yet attuned to the will of God. Only then can the soul be a true companion of God. Since this requires perfection, few have attained this state. But the soul is afflicted with infinity, a burden shared with God. The soul will suffer, and God will suffer until true companionship is established. We who share this ancient knowledge have a duty to perform, to preserve these truths until evidence of the world make their general acceptance again possible. We alone preserve these truths. The Egyptians wrote them in the pyramids, but the meaning is now obscured. The ancient Jews retain the mysteries in the Kabbalah, now lost in orthodoxy. Christianity was born with a metaphysical structure, also of the Kabbalah, 
But in combating the Roman Empire, it was changed into a practical religion for the common man, denying its pre-Christ history. The Druids understood, but their understanding has been lost. The Australian Aborigines preserve the truth of life's origin, but they are an isolated, dying race. The religions of the Orient have compounded and confounded the mysteries. Only we have preserved the truth. Do you, Apprentice Witch Alice Penfold, accept your responsibility as a guardian of the truth? Alice had no inclination to feel the wrath of the sword again. I do. You may rise. She faced her, her knees so sore she could hardly keep them from buckling. Madeline swung the sword toward her. As she fought to keep from flinching, Madeline tapped her lightly on each shoulder, the top of the head, and then brought the tip to rest just above her navel. You have been instructed in the first phase of the ancient mysteries, apprentice witch Alice Penfold. I, the Earth Mother, charge you under the penalty of the sword never reveal them to any unauthorized soul. Do you, apprentice which Alice Penfold, so understand and so swear? I do. Then I, the Earth Mother, direct you to resume your proper place in the magic circle. Madeline waited until the circle broke to admit Alice and reformed. Then the tone of her voice became less stentorian. Since we have had an initiation tonight, we will dispense with further activities in order to welcome our new apprentice witch with a champagne reception. The magic circle, therefore, will now be broken to be reformed as the Earth Mother directs. All came to congratulate Alice. She shook hands and mumbled her thanks, unsure of how to respond. They led her into the next room where hors d'oeuvres and iced champagne awaited. Alice no longer felt uncomfortable without her clothes. If it had not been for Madeline's mountainous, continually shifting overabundance of flesh, and Winona's ripe sexuality, Alice also would have forgotten the, the nakedness of others. Winona came to her with a damp cloth. We better look after your wound. She washed away the dried blood. Mad Madeline came over to watch. She put a heavy conspiratorial hand on her shoulder. I've never had an initiate step forward like that. I thought I'd skewered you good there for a moment. She clucked sympathetically as Winona's cloth bared an inch-long slit in Alice's skin. It was still bleeding slightly. Winona put a band-aid over it. I'm glad it's flesh-colored so I won't feel overdressed. The matronly women giggled. One of the men, a bookkeeper, made an attempt at conversation. Oh, what business are you in? Computer engineering. Uh, woman of the future. His pale, drawn expression clearly indicated that he considered himself a man of the past. He voiced his fear. I've been worrying about that. Could one of those things do double entry bookkeeping? They talked then for a while. Alice explained how a computer would function as the bookkeeper outlined various phases of his work. But gradually, as the evening wore on, the bookkeeper and the bank teller fell to discussing various interpretations 
of the income tax laws. The two younger women were swapping shop on gardening, and Mad Madeleine was berating American imitators of the French Impressionists for an enraptured audience. Apparently, the topics of conversation were well delineated from past meetings. They had made a gesture toward her. Now she must establish her own niche in the coven. Winona glanced around to make sure they wouldn't be overheard. As far as I've been able to determine, the whole thing is well grounded in ancient religion myths, legends, and so on. There are books I can recommend, and I will lend you some if you wish to pursue it further. Of course I do. But how many of these things will I have to attend before I have enough background for a sufficient range of credibility to discuss your experiences? Winona smiled and placed a hand boldly on her bare leg. I believe you're ready, Professor. Then you'll program some trips with me? Winona hesitated, frowning. Why don't you let me try to set it up with my psychiatrist friend? After all the work I've done with him, I hate to leave him out of it. Would he let me sit in, take notes? I don't know. We'll see. Through the next week, Alice read diligently exploring the legend of the Earth Mother. Starting with the books Winona lent her, E. O. James, The Cult of the Mother Goddess, Prehistoric Religion, Primitive Ritual and Belief, and Comparative Religions. James G. Fraser's The Golden Bough, J. E. Harrison's Ancient Art and Ritual, A. Van Gennep's Les Rites de Passage, W. C. E. Austerley's Immortality and the Unseen World. She then pursued the bibliographies. These took her further into the early religions, especially the metaphysical beliefs of the Gnostics, Kabbalah, Druids, and various Oriental sects. By Friday morning, after days without sleep, and a pile more than 200 volumes gleaned for all pertinent bits, much repetitious, she completed a series of tapes on data conformity and repetition. She took the material to work with her on Friday, and on the pretext of checking out random access capabilities in one of the new machines, ran the data through. Mad Madeline had been right. There was a pattern. Rose came by while Alice was reading the script. What's this machine set up for? Alice lied. Nothing. I am checking it to see if we will need a buffer with it. The manufacturer's claims on retrieval speed are a little more than the machine's ability, I believe. If we ever need it on real-time hookup for a complex grid, it will show a definite time lag. Suspiciously, Rose examined the output sheet. Alice knew that Rose did not believe her. But she also knew that Rose had no way of reading the data, for it was in Alice's own code. Rose frowned. Well, if, if the machine doesn't measure up, We'll just ship it back. Get this garbage out of it. We've got to set up for that long run this afternoon. To stress her hidden meaning, Rose silently shook her head and drew a finger across her throat. Alice took the output into the women's room, went into a stall, lowered her slacks, and taped the data to her thigh while mulling over a new thought. She no longer could trust Rose. From now on, she would have to be on her guard against everyone. That night, Winona called. 
How would you like to get a first-hand report from the empire of the Incas, three centuries before Columbus set out in his three little buckets? Then the trip is arranged? Well, almost. The doctor, she went on to explain, was reluctant to let Alice sit in on the sessions. He is afraid some of his colleagues will find out what he's doing more than anything. They think it's all right to do normal age regression, back to find caught at what age you started playing house or whatever. But it's considered unprofessional to go over the hump into past lives. They leave that to the amateurs who don't believe in it. The doctor had agreed, though, to allow Alice to hear some of the previous tapes Saturday night after hours. And he had implied that if everything seemed all right, they might try a session Sunday night. These two nights, she explained, were the custodian's night off. Also, none of the doctor's colleagues was apt to wander in. On Saturday night, Dr. Alfred Brandon let Alice into his offices through a side door. The psychiatrist was a large man in his fifties, hesitant in action and slow in speech. He kept a narrow stemmed pipe in constant use either in hand to fumble around with as he meditated on something, or clamped in his mouth to suck on noisily during his long pauses before speaking. He used it to stab the air in punctuation and to point for emphasis. He hammered a metal ashtray with it to vent his rare moments of anger, and he had developed a professional pose of holding it a couple of inches from his face, giving his medical pronouncements added import. That pipe was such an essential part of his personality that he never bothered to light it. He welcomed Alice courteously, but dubiously. I usually don't discuss my work, even with my colleagues, except on a consultant basis. He explained from behind his desk, turning the pipe in his hands, but looking over it to study Alice. However, Winona was persistent and she said your interest was professional. Yes. Dr. Brandon paused to suck some on his pipe. I didn't exactly understand, though, what your project is, what you plan to do with the material. I am seeking to collect all pertinent data on human experience and to reduce it to computer terms to determine man's purpose. I consider Winona's evidence of reincarnation a valuable part of the whole. Brandon studied his pipe before replying. Well, I don't know that I would use that term exactly. We don't know that there isn't some other explanation for the phenomenon. I understood that you have taken her into prior lives under hypnotic regression. What other explanation could there be? Brandon peered into the pipe's bowl a long time. I hope you will understand, even though I have the patient's permission to discuss her individual case, I must still exercise caution. May I inquire as to your professional background? Alice listed her degrees, experience, and professional memberships. She could see Brandon was impressed. Still, the doctor seemed reluctant. I suppose we could discuss the phenomenon without getting into the deeper aspects of this individual case. 
Would that be satisfactory? I don't understand. Well, you see, there are aspects, medical aspects, of the case that I have not discussed with Winona even. And before I talk with her about them, there are certain areas I must explore. In other words, there may be some highly personal facets to the case Winona does not yet know about. I am reluctant to admit a third party to the case, even with her permission, because she does not have the full knowledge necessary to make the decision. I see. However, I can appreciate your interest, and I suppose the phenomenon of the age regression to prior existences, or what appears to be that, could be studied without becoming involved with the personal aspects of the case, if you would agree. Alice agreed. Then back to your question. I'm not suggesting that there may be other explanations for the phenomenon of age regression to prior existences. I am only suggesting that perhaps we should explore the evidence a great deal further before accepting reincarnation as the only answer. But you have taken Winona back to prior existences? Well, let's just say that we have had some interesting sessions that would seem to point to, to that possibility. I will play some tapes of those sessions, and you can see what I mean. Have you participated in age regression sessions before? Alice admitted that she hadn't. Rather monotonous. If you don't keep your guard up, you can go under yourself, just listening. Taking a person back must be done slowly. I think someone once used the analogy of helping an elderly person down a flight of steps. You can't rush things. He went into another room and returned with a reel of tape. Threading it into the machine, he pushed the fast forward button. This is ordinary age regression. The tape spun off silently. I'll stop at about age six or five and let you hear some, just to give you an idea. Remember, Winona is under hypnosis, bolstered by a slight medication. Her voice will sound strange, and you may not recognize it. Alice wished she had done more research. Will she be in the present, remembering herself at that age, or reliving her experience as a child? That is difficult to answer. We try to keep subjects as objective as possible, so we won't resubmit them to any painful or traumatic experiences we may encounter. But Winona is an unusual case. At times, she appears to speak it in the present tense which would indicate that she might be reliving past experiences. He stopped the tape, then pushed another button. Alice recognized Brandon's voice. End of episode seven.